Good morning, class. This is Dr. Julie Pabigo, your dermatology moderator for today. We will be having three derma lectures this morning. Our first lecture will be on eczemas. Eczematoid dermatitis, or generally called eczemas, are one of the most common skin disorders seen in dermatology outpatient clinics. From the word dermatitis, derma meaning skin and itis meaning inflammation, these are group of skin conditions that presents with inflammation of the skin. They are not contagious. There are three stages of dermatitis, acute, subacute, and chronic. In acute dermatitis, lesions are usually about 1 to 5 days old. They present with intense inflamed, oozing, erythematous papules, and vesicular lesions. In subacute dermatitis, Lesions are usually less than two weeks old and composed of erythematous papules, patches, or plaques. Chronic dermatitis lesions will be more than two weeks and presents as dry, scaly patches or thick plaques. The following are different eczemas under this group and they are divided into the endogenous group where the etiology is still not clear and the exogenous group with which an external factor is documented as the causative factor. Let us start with the most common eczema, which is your atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is a chronic, relapsing, inflammatory disease characterized by dryness, redness, and pruritus. It has a prevalence rate of about 10 to 20% in most countries. This disease affects both children and adults, for about 20% of children and 5% in adults are seen to have atopic dermatitis in the general population. Of the 70 to 95% of atopic dermatitis cases will manifest the disease around 5 years of age, and from this group, about 60% of patients from this group are diagnosed already before their first year of life. The cause of atopic dermatitis is still not clear. It is considered a multifactorial disease with an interplay between the environment and the genetic makeup of the patient. Factors that are being investigated are as possible etiopathogenesis of atopic dermatitis are 1. The presence of the filigree gene mutation which results in an epidermal barrier defect and 2. is the immune dysregulation of the atopic patient. The progression of allergic diseases beginning with atopic dermatitis is referred to as the atopic march or the allergic march. The atopic march occurs when patients develop multiple allergic conditions as they age and may include atopic dermatitis, food allergies, allergic rhinitis, and bronchial asthma. Atopic dermatitis manifests early on as in infancy. It waxes and wanes and throughout the patient's lifetime, about one-third of patients with atopic dermatitis may develop asthma and about a third of them may develop allergic rhinitis. Please take note that pruritus is the hallmark of atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is really a very itchy disease. Stages of atopic dermatitis according to age and location of lesions. For infantile stage, onset is between 2 months and 2 years of age. The childhood stage will be from 2 years to 10 years of age. And for adult stage, it is beyond 10 years of age. Here is a picture of sites of predilection for atopic dermatitis. For the infantile type, the lesions are usually on the scalp, 
the face extensor surface of extremities. So this is from 2 months to 2 years of age. As the child grows, the lesions now will be in different parts of the body. They will now be in the flexural folds of your extremities, which will be your antecubital and your popliteal fossa. The neck area and the ankles are also involved. The rights of predilection for childhood and adult type of atopic dermatitis are the same. Here are some photos of infantile stage atopic dermatitis. Please note sparing of the nasolabial folds for lesions on the face for infantile type of atopic dermatitis. Here, again, sparing of nasolabial folds. You have all the rashes on the other parts of the face. Extensor aspects of the extremity. In the childhood stage of atopic dermatitis, the lesions this time will be located at the flexural aspect of the extremities. Face may also be affected. So lesions are more dry compared to that of the infantile stage. So antecubital area, popliteal area. Here, popliteal area. For adult type of atopic dermatitis, lesions are usually poorly defined and they have a lot of lichenification and excoriation due to constant scratching and rubbing. The sites of predilection for adult type of atopic dermatitis is similar to that of child type of atopic dermatitis. So some photos of adult type of atopic dermatitis. Essential features for atopic dermatitis are the following. There should be presence of pruritus as this is the hallmark. Disease is chronic and relapsing and important also will be the typical distribution of lesions or what we call the sites of predilection. For infants, facial, neck, and extensors, for child and adult, it will be on the flexural areas. Other important features for the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis or that adds support to your diagnosis of atopic dermatitis will be the early age of onset, presence of atopy, either personal or family history of atopic diseases like asthma, allergic rhinitis, or even of another member of the family with atopic dermatitis, or elevated serum IgE levels. Also present and will add support to the diagnosis will be the presence of dry skin or what we call cirrhosis. Here are secondary features of atopic dermatitis which will suge are suggestive of the diagnosis. Some photos of secondary features of atopic dermatitis. This is pteriasis alba. Here, it's ill-defined hypopigmented patches that are dry. The Denny Morgan fold. It's a secondary fold or eyelid due to constant scratching of the patient because of the, the eye area is also very itchy. This is keratosis pilaris, usually on the upper arms and sometimes on the anterior thigh of patients. Hyperlinearity of the palms and nipple eczema. Usually, diagnosis of atopic dermatitis is clinical. No specific laboratory test is necessary. There are no specific biomarkers also for atopic dermatitis or for the assessment of disease severity. But in special cases like with presence of secondary bacterial infection, 
which is usually staph aureus or a secondary viral infection, which the most common vir viral uh, infection is herpes simplex. Then you might want to do gram stain or chunk smear. Sometimes, serum IgE level may help in the diagnosis if you want to differentiate atopic dermatitis from other eczematoid dermatitis in this group. This is a photo of a patient with atopic dermatitis and secondary bacterial infection. Emollients or what we call moisturizers are important in the initial and maintenance phase of treatment of atopic dermatitis. It should be hypoallergenic, which means they have no perfumes, no colorants, and less preservatives so that it doesn't add on to the irritation of the patient. Use of wet dressings are advised if the lesions are oozing. Try as much as possible to avoid irritants, which are identified as the following, strong detergents, fabric softeners, carpets, house dust mites, sweating. For food allergies, these are only considered when you have a patient with severe type of atopic dermatitis. In the management of atopic dermatitis, topical corticosteroids are also a mainstay in the treatment when the moisturizers are not enough to control atopic dermatitis or improve the skin condition. Here is the mechanism of action for corticosteroids. Steroids work well for eczemas. It suppresses the inflammation and the itch of the patient. Although they are not curative, lesions may recur when you stop using the steroids. So here are indications of the corticosteroids. So aside from eczematoid dermatitis, corticosteroids can also be indicated for psoriasis and for insect bites. Corticosteroids are best avoided in untreated bacterial or fungal infections and also even viral in diseases as this will exaggerate these infections. When prescribing corticosteroids, you have to take into consideration the duration of treatment, how long do you plan to give the corticosteroids, the area of the skin being treated, the condition of the skin, potency of the topical corticosteroids you want to prescribe, will you be occluding the lesion or not, and the age of the patient. Potency of corticosteroids are classified into seven groups. Class 1 as the most potent and class 7 as the least potent. Here are the potency ranking of the corticosteroids. Class 1 will be the super potent. Class 2 will be potent. And class 6 and 7 will be the mild or the least potent. Especially hydrocortisone. Potency of corticosteroids are dependent on the formulation and concentration of the drug, frequency of administration, once or twice a day, duration of treatment, how long, one week or two weeks or one month, sites of application, and generic versus branded. In general, ointments are more potent than creams or lotions, so this is the formulation. Example, betamethasone valerate. If it's in an ointment, then the classification or the potency is higher than the cream. And the lotion is the least potent of the betamethasone valerate, 0.1%. So this is what we mean by the formulation of the drug. 
If you occlude the area where you apply the corticosteroid, then it increases the potency of the steroid. And for site of application, example, when you apply same drug on the intertrigenous areas, it will become more potent versus applying the same corticosteroid on the palm area. So this, is the, this depends on the thickness of the skin. So for area or ideal application, most of the time, the head and neck area, you use a lower potency corticosteroid. While for body, hands, arms, and legs, you can use from mid-potent to high-potent corticosteroids. Low potency steroids are usually from class 5, 6, and 7. They are the preferred choice of corticosteroids for areas that are thin skin, like your face, your axilla, your groin area. And they are also more preferred for young children and infants or in the elderly who have already very thin skin. So example of a mild corticosteroid is hydrocortisone and desonide. For mid-potency steroid, which is around the class 3 to class 5, you can use these on areas that are non-facial or non-intertrigenous areas. So example will be your betamethasone valerate and mometasone furate. High potency steroids are usually the class 1 and class 2 because they are super potent or high potent steroids as much as possible you should have limited time of application only for a maximum of 2 to 3 weeks. This is best for lesions that are chronic and are thick also and areas where there is poor skin penetration, like your palms and soles. Example of potent corticosteroid will be your clobetasol propionate and your betamethasone dipropionate. So that's for topical corticosteroids. Let's go to another drug that is used for the management of atopic dermatitis. And these are your immunomodulators. You have two topical calcineurin inhibitors, the pimecrolimus and the tacrolimus. Tacrolimus comes in two preparations. 0.03% are usually for the pediatric age group and the 0.1% is usually for adults. The immunomodulators like tacrolimus is a non-steroidal agent that can also help decrease your inflammation. The mechanism of action of your immunomodulator is it inhibits production of interleukin-2. Hence, the overall effect of these calcineurin inhibitors is to decrease T-cell proliferation and reduce inflammatory cytokine production of interleukins. And like tacrolimus and pimecrolimus, these are second-line therapy for atopic dermatitis. They are used for patients in whom alternative conventional therapies are inadvisable or patients not adequately responsive to or are intolerant of alternative conventional therapies. Like example, your patient has already side effects from applying your topical corticosteroids. You can try and shift to a non-steroidal drug which is your calcineurin inhibitor. So these are your tacrolimus and pimecrolimus. Antihistamines may be of use also for atopic dermatitis, especially for children who have sleep disturbances. So antihistamines that may of help for the pediatric age group will be the sedating ones, the diphenhydramine hydrochloride, which we call Benadryl, your hydroxycin, and your cetirizine. Sometimes in atopic dermatitis, they can be easily secondarily infected, bacteria or viral. So your anti-infectives might be of help also. 
Alternative therapies for atopic dermatitis are the following. And these are usually used for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis that are not respond that are not responding to your usual conventional treatment of moisturizers and topical therapies. These are your cyclosporine, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil. Your phototherapy can also be used, especially the narrow band UVB. And what's new in atopic dermatitis, one that has been recently approved by US FDA for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis is your dupilumab. It inhibits your interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. And topical presaborol, which is also approved in the U.S. for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. Because atopic dermatitis is a chronic relapsing type of skin disorder and we cannot use corticosteroids continuously, most experts have proposed a treatment plan called proactive treatment. This is the use of long-term, low-dose, intermittent application of your anti-inflammatory agents. Either you use your topical corticosteroids or your topical calcineurin inhibitors. In reactive treatment, wherein when the patient has the rashes, that's when they apply the medicine, we will now shift to proactive treatment, wherein we don't see physically any signs of rashes but we continuously apply the medicine but at low dose and intermittent application like two days of every week you apply the drug of choice for your patient so that you decrease the number of times that the patient will flare it was observed that even though you don't physically see any erythematous rashes on atopic patients, they have some clinical inflammation. Let's go for some questions for atopic dermatitis as self-assessment. Question number one. The following is are the most common presenting sign or symptom for atopic dermatitis. A. Is it the Denny Morgan fold? It is pityriasis alba, rhytus, or keratosis pilaris. Which of these is the most common presenting sign or symptom for atopic dermatitis? The answer is pruritus because this is the hallmark for atopic dermatitis. Next, which of the following is the initial intervention for atopic dermatitis? It is your topical corticosteroid creams, skin moisturizers, immunomodulator medication, or phototherapy. The answer will be moisturizers. Moisturizers are important at the start and even on the maintenance phase for atopic dermatitis let's now proceed to another eczematoid dermatitis and that's your nomular dermatitis nomular dermatitis is also called discoid eczema the lesions are described as erythematous papules and vesicles forming round or coin-like lesions they may be solitary or symmetrical in distribution this lesion, again, is also very pruritic. Treatment will be wet dressings if the lesions are weeping or oozing, topical corticosteroids, oral antihistamines, and if secondary infected, then your anti-infectives. Here are some photos of nomular dermatitis. Next, we go to this hydrotic dermatitis or this hydrotic eczema. Previously, this was also called pomphalix. 
The lesions are described as deep-seated vesicular lesions like sago grains or tapioca-like on the sides of the fingers and toes and sometimes also on the palms and soles. These are intensely pruritic and sometimes they might be secondarily infected also. The sago grain-like or tapioca-like lesions, which represents your deep-seated vesicular lesions at the sides and at the palm of the hand. So they can easily be secondarily infected. Treatment will be to keep the hands and free as dry as possible, avoid strong irritants like detergents, Use moisturizers and for medicines, your topical corticosteroids, your oral antihistamines, and if it is secondary infected, your anti-infectives. Next, lichen simplex chronicus. These are localized form of lichenified skin. They may last for many years with patients constantly rubbing and scratching it. They are said to be frequently seen in women above 20 years of age. Here are some photos of lichen simplex chronicus. Please note the exaggerated skin lines of the patient. Thickened, plaque-like. Here. Lichen simplex chronicus is also called neurodermatitis. So most lesions are described as solid plaque of lichenification and they can be found anywhere in the body. Management for lichen simplex chronicus are with your potent corticosteroids and oral antihistamines. You need to advise your patient to stop scratching and rubbing it. So thick erythematous lichenified lesion. So this is your neurodermatitis or lichen simplex chronicus. Sometimes they can be hyperpigmented also or hypopigmented. Let's now go to the exogenous group. The first one will be your contact dermatitis. Contact dermatitis are inflammatory reaction of the skin which reacts to a chemical that has come in contact with the skin. They are of two types, the irritant contact dermatitis and the allergic contact dermatitis. The most common one is the irritant contact dermatitis. It is non-immunologic. The inflammatory reaction results from an exposure to a substance that causes eruption of the lesions. While in allergic contact dermatitis, this is immunologic. There should be an acquired sensitivity to the substance that produces the inflammatory reaction. Factors affecting the response to a chemical contact are the following. The chemical itself, it is very strong. The individual, either elderly, very young, or the patient has an atopic dermatitis or a diseased skin. The exposure, how long was the patient exposed, was their history of previous exposure, and the environment. Irritant contact dermatitis may be caused by strong alkalis, strong acids, and the following. In allergic contact dermatitis, there should be contact with previously sensitized skin. So most likely, this is a delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction. Here are some common causes of your allergic contact dermatitis. A special test may be needed to document contact dermatitis and this is called patch test or patch testing. This is to determine hypersensitivity to a certain substance that has come in contact with the skin of the patient. 
So substances that are usually suspects are if it's in the face, then you might suspect cosmetics. If it's on the hair scalp area, is it the hair dye? So you have to ask that from the history of the patient. If it's on the wrist area, is could it be the watch that the patient is wearing? So it could be nickel dermatitis. In uh, women who are doing household chores and have uh, contact dermatitis of both hands, you suspect strong detergents that they have been using, and so on. This is what we do for patch test. Okay. This is your aluminum fin chamber. Okay, this is where you put the substance. Okay, and then after you completed putting all the substance, you patch it literally at the back of the patient. Okay. So after 48 hours, the patient will come back for reading. So this is what it looks like after you finish your procedure. So here are all the substances that are embedded. It is on the skin of the patient. Usually, we try to use the back of the patient. And then after 48 hours, and then there's going to be a second reading at the 72nd hour. So, we remove the patch and then we try to read. Like for example, you have erythema. If it's slight erythema, then you can say plus one. Like this one and this one. But this one, you have a small vesicle so this might be plus two and you have something like this lots of vesicle and even one bulla then this could be plus three okay. which means the patient is severely reactive to this substance and moderately reactive to balsam of peru and mildly reactive to fragrance and colophony these are substances that you find in perfume if you get a result in 48 hours like this, like everything seems so red, we call this the angry back syndrome. You have to treat the patient with topical corticosteroids, rest first the skin, and then repeat your patch test. Here will be some photos of contact dermatitis, like this one. Contact dermatitis, so some detergents. contact dermatitis this is contact dermatitis to a perfume when the patient sprayed the perfume it tracked down and where the perfume uh, came in contact with the skin the patient developed inflammation housewife's dermatitis so the dorsal aspect of the hands usually to detergents Contact dermatitis to lipstick, so the patient presents with swollen lips. Contact dermatitis to the saliva, this is your lip leaking dermatitis. And this is uh, contact dermatitis to tattoo herbal, it's a herbal tattoo. Okay. So sometimes after the inflammation has subsided for tattoo dermatitis, you can still see faint traces of the lesion. Okay. This will be the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. There are some medicines that can cause contact dermatitis. Uh, here is one due to eye drops. So we call this dermatitis medicamentosa. Allergy to the elastic rubber from the underwear of the patient rubber gloves allergy phytodermatitis due to plant nickel dermatitis okay, because of the buckle of the maong jeans so I came in contact with the peri umbilical area this is contact dermatitis due to the watch so this is nickel dermatitis shoe or leather dermatitis it conforms to the shape of the footwear of the patient 
shoe dermatitis. Okay, so the shape of the shoes is like this. So the whole area practically is very red and itchy. Hence, for contact dermatitis, the best solution is to identify and avoid the contactant. Medications will be almost the same as the other dermatitis, wet dressings if the lesion is whipping or oozing, topical corticosteroids, oral antihistamines, and anti-infectives if there are signs of secondary infection. The last of the eczema group is osteotic eczema. This is also called the winter's itch, eczema craquelae, or serotic eczema. This is mostly seen during cold season or winter. Skin becomes dry and dehydrated, and this is most commonly noted on the lower extremities. Lesions are described as pruritic dry erythematous patches with superficial fissure-like or cracks on the skin. So this is most common in the elderly. Treatment will be mild steroids. Do not use potent steroids for this condition. It needs a lot of emollients. So let's now go to some questions and for self-assessment. Which of the following is true for nomular dermatitis? Lesions described as sago-like or deep-seated vesicles or lesions described as circumscribed coin-like erythematous patches or plaques. So the answer is coin-like erythematous patches and plaques. That's for nomular dermatitis. Which of the following best describe lesions of lichen simplex chronicus? Erythematous scaly lesions, both cheeks with sparing of the nasolabial folds, erythematous scaly lichenified or thick plaques, or erythematous scaly papules and plaques on the scalp, eyebrows, and chest. The answer here is B. A. Erythematous scaly lesions on the cheeks with sparing of the nasal label folds is your atopic dermatitis. The C. Erythematous scaly papules and plaques on the scalp, eyebrows, and chest is seborrheic dermatitis. Let's go for one case. Six-month-old baby girl with rashes on the face on and off for three months. Keeps rubbing the face, steroid responsive, and mother is asthmatic. So, which of the following is your diagnosis? Is this food allergy, seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, or contact dermatitis? The answer here is atopic dermatitis. Why? Because early age of onset, which is 6 months of age, Facial involvement okay, with sparing of the nasal labial area, erythema, scaling, pruritus, and mother has positive history of atopy, which is asthma. Okay, that's the end of the lecture. Let's rest for a while and then we will proceed to our second lecture.